www.kathyrowe.com. of staging and formations. I'm going to be showing you just tons of clips from dances I've choreographed in the past, all in slow motion so that we can really get a good look. But I want to warn you in advance, when you see these clips, sometimes there'll be little titles above or below, and what that is, is I'm pointing out from where I got the clip. A lot of them have come from various videos that I have put out, and so I put the names of those, uh, those little clips, the names of the videos, so that if you want to see it further, you'll know where to look. So before we talk about staging and formations, let's talk just a little bit about dance composition. Of course, we all know that dances are composed of time, space, and energy. And we're mostly going to be talking about the time and the space elements. Uh, let's talk about time for a minute. Uh, time, for example, we could use a tool known as canon. And what canon is, it's sort of like, you know, when we were kids and we would sing three blind mice or row your boat. It's just one phrase following the other in a delay. Now when we talk about space, we're talking about a couple of things. We're talking about our performance space, number one, or you know, your set or your proscenium stage. We're also talking about spatial relationships between the dancers, or we're just talking about uh, the space that's relative to where you're performing and the choreography. So space gets into a little bit more complex types of notions. Let's talk first about the space where you perform, which would be like your stage or your set. We're going to go over here and I've got this little piece of paper that we're going to make a chart on. Let's pretend like this is our stage and what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about terminology so we all know the terminology for staging. Let's say this is your audience down here. Here's all the people sitting in the audience. So if the stage was lifted up like this, you would be in the audience. You see what I mean? The audience is your way. When we're on a stage, let's say it's a proscenium stage in a theater. Usually a proscenium stage will be f about 40 feet across this way, if you're lucky, and maybe about 25 or 30 feet back. So when you're on stage, the back of the stage we refer to as the upstage. The front of the stage, the one nearest the audience, we're going to refer to that as the downstage because stages used to be raked, they used to be tilted like this in, in the olden days. Like if you, if you were around in Shakespeare's time when you watched a play, they would be tilted so that the actors up here on the upstage could be seen a little bit more easier. So that's where those names came from. Now we also have stage right and stage left that we need to refer to. And if you're in the audience, this used to always confuse me, when you're in the audience, like I'd be watching in the audience, this would be my right hand. So I would think, well, that's the stage right. But no, it all comes from the dancer's vantage point. So I'm the dancer and you're the audience. So this over here would be stage right. And over here, this side, would be stage left. So now we know the directions of our stage. When we are doing a solo, a trio, a duet, or a big group piece, it doesn't matter what we're doing, it's, it's hardest with a solo. What we always want to do is think about our performing space. I think mm, beginners, I used to teach choreography at University of Hawaii, and I would notice that the beginning choreographers, they kind of like always hang out in this region right here on the space. They, they wouldn't explore it too much until we did our chapter on space, and then it was like they were everywhere. So once you know about this, it gets a little bit easier to incorporate. <coughs> Let's say we'll start with our dancer in the middle. 
what we have to remember are there are many, many directions to go and to take your choreography. Of course, we can go to the front and we can go to the back. And we can go, this is a real popular one, we can go to the side and we can go to the side. Lots of dancers just move side to side across the stage, but we need to create depth, so we need to go front to back and side to side. Of course, we can also go on all of these diagonals. And you know, when you're choreographing your dances, you want to think about all these directions and make sure you hit them, or at least some of them. So we have all these directions to go in and, you know, all the little nuances in between. Of course, we also have circular motion. Your dancers can travel in a circle around the stage. You know, this is so typically, we always see in the ballet how they do those PK turns in a big circle. You know, PK, 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 circling all around the stage. I know you know what I mean. But there's lots of things you can do in a circle besides PK turns. So we have the circle. We also can have our dancers moving on a figure eight. So just say they go, chasse, chasse, turn, 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 chasse, chasse, turn, turn. You know, any movement that you can make up. But we can also do those figure eights. And of course, you can also do the square all the way around. So we have our dancers moving in this direction, just coming around. Now what's kind of cool, we'll do this a lot later, but what's kind of cool if you have the square going this way and at the same time if you have a group dance you have the square going this way on the inside. That's kind of neat and you can also do it with circles. But anyway what I'm getting at is there's lots of places to travel to on the stage itself and when you're composing your dances you, you know there's those little times when you get stuck and go mmm what shall I do next? Well it always kind of helps to you know stimulate some new thought to go well I haven't gone in my figure eight, or I haven't gone in my circle, or I haven't gone in my diagonal, or of course there's always, I haven't gone in my V. So you can always think about the directions that kind of gives you a little boost. One of the first things we're going to talk about, because I think they're a little bit hard to choreograph, are duets. You don't have a lot of dancers on stage with which to create relationships relationships such as a time relationship or a space relationship. So let's look at some duets. In a duet it becomes a little easier to create spatial interest than in a solo because we have some spatial relationship. In this duet the dancers are doing similar movements but at different levels. In this duet you see the use of canon. One dancer is just one phrase behind the other. So this would be a time manipulation. A canon is also sometimes called a round. Another example of manipulating time is through a method called question and answer. You see this a lot in theatrical dance where one dancer does a step and the other dancer answers with a movement. In duets I always try to create relationships and designs between the dancers so that I don't fall into what I call the duet trap, doing two simultaneous solos. I think that duets are particularly challenging because you don't have numbers of dancers with which to create design and interest. Let's go back to the element of time and I'll show you some examples of canon as that is one of the most basic ways to start creating staging. Here's a basic canon that moves up from the floor. So I not only have the canon but the level change. The three girls in the back are performing the basic material while the duet and the solo girls are phrases behind. Let's take a look at the most basic example of canon. All three of these dancers are performing the exact same combination, but they are each just one phrase behind the other. What creates interest is the fact that the levels change within the combination. Dancers go from standing to the floor to standing again. And of course, I always try to find a place in the choreography where I can unite the dancers once more into unison. Here we have three dancers doing the same choreography, just each a phrase behind the other. Again, you'll see them unite here right on the preparation. Here it comes. And then the movement falls together into unison. Throughout the dance, more and more dancers enter until I have a full stage and I have them dancing in unison. Then I take that same opening material and the dancers all repeat it. It looks much different here with 12 dancers, doesn't it? In fact, with this many dancers, we could say that the canon has gone into what's called chaos.
It looks to the untrained eye as if everyone is doing something different, but really it's just the same simple combination done by four groups of three. Then we see the choreography unite into unison once more. This canon is done in two lines. You'll see the front line repeating the first count of eight, while the back line performs the combination without the repeat. I think that this canon works nicely because the movement goes front and back, and then it's followed by a level change, and then the movement goes side to side. This is basically the same concept, except it's the back row that repeats the first count of eight. After the canon, we're going to go into a bit of chaos again. The chaos section is actually two counts of eight, where each dancer got to choose from somewhere in the dance two phrases of eight that they particularly liked. After the two counts of eight, the dancers fall back into unison and into organized formations. This canon is a little bit more complex. I've teamed up couples of dancers and each couple performs the combo together, one on the right side and one on the left side, so they each have to learn it on their own side. After each count of eight, another couple enters, thus creating the canon. Now to have this work, we need movement that crosses the stage from side to side, but then comes back to the center to complete. As it comes back into the center stage, we make the choreography more interesting by incorporating level changes. So let's watch that row in the back. You're going to see them go into their medium, right here, then they go up to their high level and back down to low. I think that trio staging is really challenging and rather difficult to make interesting. Let's look at some ways to tackle the trio. In this example, the dancers are all doing the exact same combination, it's just in canon. This type of canon, though, needs to be choreographed to travel full stage. The material needs to travel far to the stage left, then far to the stage right, but I really wanted it to end up in the center. By ending up in the center, I had a place for the dancers all to meet. So you'll see them here all coming to meet. And then the dancers can find a place to start the combo over again, but this time in unison. In this example, there is no canon or time manipulation. The dancers are doing the combo in unison the whole time, but the space element is affected. You see that the middle dancer is in the opposite direction of the other two. She travels front as the duet travels back and vice versa. This technique creates interest in the arena of spatial manipulation. In this trio, we will see a lot of spatial changes. The dancers go in and out of unison movement with level and movement exclusive to each other. We also see a relationship established as the two dancers relate to the dancer on the floor. Again, the combination is going to resolve in unison. I choreographed this trio to Blues in the Night, which is a pretty spectacular jazz song. I had three soloists, really, and each had an exclusive solo of their own for the first three verses. Whenever a new verse started, a new soloist entered. Again, each of these dancers has their very own material. None of it repeats. In the fourth verse, though, I wanted all three soloists to come on stage and do their material together. Fortunately, it all blended and worked out really well. After they each did their solo together, I wanted to find a place where I could resolve in unison. And then they all did the first soloist combination to conclude the dance. Level changes refer to the spatial aspects of dance and can be super simple as we see here. I have merely placed the dancers in positions that are high, medium, and low and choreographed a very simple port de bras. Because of the added depth and shape of the skirt, this very simple piece was very stunning on stage. Here's another example of placing dancers at high, medium, and low levels and choreographing just a simple port de bras. I think that this simplicity is really beautiful. 
Here's an example of choreographing high, medium, and low through more complex choreography. Instead of just the dancers being in high, medium, or low positions, the choreography itself takes the dancers to their levels. In this Charleston section, I've choreographed the high, medium, and low choreography on the step back after the kick. I think the effect is really cute and eye-catching. Here we see the high and low levels again, but this time the dancers are also performing the material in canon. The low group, of course, has to make a little bit of adaptation, but not much. So here we see both the time manipulation of canon and the spatial relationship of level change. In this staging, we see two different combinations being performed simultaneously. The floor combination is completely different material than that of the standing dancers, yet the two separate combinations seem to complement each other perfectly. This takes some planning, and usually the floor combination has to be performed pretty much in place to avoid a crash. But again in the end, we see the movement that is similar and about to return to unison. I don't like to choreograph a lot of solos, as they are really pretty tough to make interesting, but I love to choreograph for feature dancers. As you can see, the girl in the red is obviously the feature dancer, but I've used a number of other dancers to create a sort of moving backdrop for her. I think this adds character and interest to the piece. In this dance, the background dancers mimic the movement of the feature dancer, but they maintain a level change difference. In fact, I purposely choreographed the background dancers to move in directional opposition to the feature dancer. When they go down, she goes up. When they go right, she goes left. Here we see the feature dancer with a large group of background dancers. From now on, let's call those background dancers the supporting dancers, kind of like a supporting actress in a movie. Here the supporting dancers go in and out of mimicking the feature dancer's movement. But what's really different about this piece is I've introduced an element of emotional relationship between the supporting dancers and the feature dancer. In this example, I've taken that staging technique even farther. Although most focus stays on the feature dancer, we clearly see that the supporting dancers are involved emotionally as well as design-wise with the feature dancer. This pulls our focus back and forth from the supporting group to the feature dancer and allows the feature dancer to sort of drift in and out of the group. For lines right and left, let's start looking at some charts. We're going to start really simply with these formations and then we'll work our way up. I'm just going to talk now about formations that enter the stage in lines. So this is a really nice way to enter, especially if you have a big group number. I did this as a big finale. So I've got lines of dancers coming in like this. Maybe I have three people in this wing, three people or five people or however many you have. They're in the wings and they're waiting to come out. And they're over here too. So as you can see, this is going to be a big group piece because three in each wing, that makes six people in each line, right? So for them to come out on stage, we already know this is the upstage, this is the downstage, this is stage left, and this is stage right. Now the odd thing is, on stage left, if you're going to be walking out to the audience, you've got to start these dancers on their right foot. So stage, dance use, stage left dancers usually start, if they're coming out, on their right foot. Stage right dancers over there usually have to start on their left foot when they come out facing the front. Of course, you know, you don't have to, but that's pretty much the norm. So anyway, these guys on stage left are coming out on their right foot. These guys are coming out on their left foot. If they're all facing the front, they're on different feet, right? So they're going to come out right here and meet, right here and meet. All these dancers are coming out and now I'm going to have lines of dancers, however many of you have come out to the wings, I have lines of them across the stage. So if you want them to meet in the middle, that would be fine. But what I wanted them to do was cross each other. So these three had to go all the way across and these three all the way across. So this dancer right here and this dancer right here are going to be my center dancers. So you might want to sneak your like really good center dancers into these spots. 
because these are going to be the people in the center of your combo. Once I did the crossover, I had them on different feet and I had to find a place for them to all catch up and be on the same foot because I had them come out and then go into a combination. So let's take a look at that clip. Here's the movement we just looked at on that chart. You can see that some dancers are coming in on the right and some on the left and that they're passing each other by. They're still on the right and left foot and I'm going to have to find a place in the choreography for them to catch up and all be on the same foot so that they can do the combination together. Here's the place. Here's another example of that same type of entrance where the stage left lines start on their right foot and the stage right lines start on their left foot. But in this entrance, the lines come out in canon. Therefore, they execute the level change at different times. This is nice because each line gets to be seen, even that far away line in the back. And of course, I want to resolve in unison movement. This is the same idea. The lines come in starting on different feet from the right and left wings. Here we can clearly see the more complex use of canon. So you can really get a good feel for what's going on here. I'm going to show you the choreography slowly and from the back. One, two, lay out three and four, five, jump, six, walk, seven, walk, eight. From there, step out to the side. One, two, three, kick, four, five, six, turn, seven, turn, eight. And you're ready to start again on your right foot so you can do it all the way across the stage. So let's try it again, one more time. I'm gonna take little steps. Again, your dancers are gonna really haul, so here we go. We're coming across one, two, three, and five, six, and seven, eight. One, two, three, up on four, five, six, turn seven, turn eight. Now this is, again, the old right and left trick, only guess what? This time, you really do have to learn the combo on the right and on the left. But this is great to do in your class across the floor. You can do it across the floor as a combo on the right, across the floor as a combo on the left, and then when it gets time to teach your choreography, your kids already know this part. Let's look at this choreography again in slow motion and I think you'll be able to clearly see the staging now that you're familiar with the movement. You might also notice that there is level change in the movement itself, the high kicks and the low layouts at the same time, which makes it all more interesting. Next we're going to talk about one of my very favorite little staging tricks. I've got line, rows of dancers like this and they've all come up through the ranks now I've got four rows of four dancers. This is so tidy. So I just had all of that chaos going on. Now it's time to be tidy. And when you're choreographing and staging, you do want to go back and forth from your unison to your chaos, to your unison to your chaos, just so the audience has a chance to focus in for a moment. So now I've got all these tidy little rows of dancers. And they're going to dance one time in unison. I know in, in my mind already that I'm going to do what I call the old right-left trick. This line's going to go to the right, this line's going to go to the left, this line's going to go to the right, and this line's going to go to the left in a minute. First though, we're going to dance in unison. So we dance a whole combination in unison. When you're making up your combinations that you're going to use the old right-left trick, you've got to have combinations that move to the right and left. They can't stay still. They've got to be moving back and forth. So my whole troop of 16 people, or however many you have, 12, or however many rows you have, are all going to dance in unison and they're going to do this combo to the right and then to the left and then to the right and then to the left or, you know, however it goes. Then you want this line and this line to go in the different direction. So when these guys are going this way, these guys will be going this way. There's two ways you can do it. The easy way and the not so easy way. Well, they're both not so easy, but one's a little bit harder. The hardest way, I think, is making all my dancers, or making the people in this row and this row, making them learn it on the left. So you can do that, and I do that sometimes. So you learn a combo to the right, and then you learn the exact same combo to the left. So these guys start on the, going to the right, these guys start going to the left. That's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it that's just not as hard as that is you make this row and this row turn around and do the combination to the back. That's what we're going to do 
in this dance. This row is going to be moving to stage left because they're facing backwards. So in other words, here's the combination. Let's just say it goes this way. One, two, three, four. Well, I went to the right, but if I turned around, one, two, three, four. I'm still on my right foot, but now I'm going towards stage left. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do the old right left trick and we're going to do it first in unison then we'll go right left by making the second and fourth row turn to the back. I'm showing you this example because I just make a slight variation that I think works well. Again, they're doing the same dance, just the even rows turn to the back. But I've delayed the backward rows just for two counts of eight here so I can have the level change during the jumps. Then we see a peel off of those first two rows and that leaves the back two lines of people to now be seen by the audience. Here we see the same staging technique of first doing a group unison and then having the even rows turn to the back and perform the combo so that we have a right and left movement. I think this is particularly interesting because I've choreographed a lot of angles. The side bump mont is on an angle, the Charleston kicks, and that little jump. In this example, the dancers start with the direction change, but they are still all on the same foot. They just go in different directions. Now you're going to see a preparation for a turn here, and on the preparation for the turn, the even rows will switch to the other foot. Now we have oppositional choreography because the odd rows are doing the combo to the right, and the even rows are doing the same choreography, but to the left. Here I have three rows of dancers. The first and third row are doing the combination on the right. The middle row had to learn the same combination on the left. This way they're all facing the front, but opposition is created. Now you're going to see a place where I'm going to pull them together. I had to decide in the movement where to pull them together and it was right here on that drag. So now when we do the leaps, they're all in unison. And you see they do their leaps into the formation of a circle. Circles are great because you can do so much with them. Going into the circle and I make a little flower opening thing. And of course they can go out of the circle. Circles easily become lines with windows for the dancers to move through. I love to use lifts in staging, but like most dance teachers, I have a ton of girls and hardly any boys to do the lifting. Therefore, it takes a lot of girl power to execute a lift. I like to hide the mechanics of the lift behind other dancers as shown here. Then we just get to see the gorgeous lift floating above the dance and not all that grunting that usually goes on. Here's an even more dramatic example. Only three girls are getting lifted, but you can see it takes nine girls to do the lifting. So again, we see my little staging technique of disguising the mechanics of the lifting with the three feature dancers up front. Then the lifted girls seem to just hover above the dance that's being performed on stage. Let's move on and talk about formations. Let's look at some really simple right-left lines. These lines come in as a V. So we already know this is our downstage, this is our upstage, and this is our stage left, and this is our stage right. Now when the dancers are coming in as a V, we have to talk about the apex of that triangle. So, you know, if a triangle is this way, down here where my wrists are, would be the apex of that little triangle that I'm making. So in this example, I have dancers coming in like this. These are the dancers. They're coming in from the wings, and these guys who are a little bit closer to each other have started maybe two, two or four counts ahead of everybody else. So they're coming in like this. And you can see as these dancers are coming in, it appears as if they're going to make a downstage apex. They're coming in this way. But no, we're going to be tricky. These dancers are going to cross each other. So look, when they cross, you have to decide which line is going to cross in front of the other. 
This little empty space in here, we're going to call that the window. So when we talk about going through the lines, we have to tell these dancers over here, you're going to go through the window. So these dancers know what their little job is. Now these dancers, of course, are also going to go through the window, but I'm going to have these dancers go in front. So this guy is going to go in front of this guy like this. This guy is going to go in the window. So they're kind of the front line going through. Now, as you can imagine, they've come in like this, but after they all go through the windows and they keep traveling like this, you're going to have a formation of that triangle, or V, with the upstage apex. So that's kind of a nice little staging trick. They, all, they come in in the V, they go through, and they change from a downstage to an upstage apex. And then you'll see, I, I have all the dancers here, lots of them in the lines. These guys are going to exit. They do a little combo, and then they go away. They don't even cross. They just go away. These three dancers right here, they're going to stay. However, you'll see this dancer here that was the apex, the upstage apex, she's going to sneak her way in front here. So by the time they do the trio, I've got these three dancers again, but they're in the downstage apex. So let's take a look at that clip. Here we see the diagonals coming in, and it looks as if we're going to make a downstage apex. But the dancers go through the windows, and now we have an upstage apex. The dancers are going to just all do that short combo we talked about, and all but the middle three dancers are going to exit. And you'll see that that middle dancer up at the apex moves forward, so now the trio moves into place with a downstage apex. This next example is from the Waltz of the Flowers from my Nutcracker All Jazzed Up. Now, we talked about going through the windows in those diagonal lines, and now we're just going to go a little bit farther with that idea. So when I did this number, I had girls coming out from the wings back here. We know this is the upstage, so we're going to say they're coming out from the upstage wings, the ones in the back. Now this is a little tricky and it takes a little coordination and probably when you get into your Jazz 2 class or some class like that, you can do this across the floor and have the kids practice. So I had a lot of dancers, let's say I have eight dancers coming from this side and eight dancers coming from this side. We have to coordinate it so one goes ahead of the other. So it would be like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like they're going to meet in the middle, but they don't. Seven, eight. Somebody's got to go in the front. So let's say it's the people over here on stage left that get to go in the front of these people over here. So what I have is every eight counts, I have somebody coming on. One, and you know what? They come on together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they have to be a little bit tricky, and this guy has to get in front of this guy. It happens over and over again. Every eight counts. Now what happens is they come in. They cross through the windows, through those little windows in time. Right here, they do a little PK arabesque, and they run off. But they hurry up around the wings in the back, and then by the time everybody's done going across, let's say this is the first dancer. The first dancer did their PK arabesque. They come around, and they're on the back, by the time they're done, the last dancer over here, she's already coming out across the back of the stage like this. Now the same thing has happened with the first dancer here. She's run off and she ran around backstage really fast and now she's going to come on back here. So they're coming on and making two lines. Now whenever you have two lines, you're going to see this. It's pretty easy to go into a circle or a clump. You can make lots of things out of two lines. Now we're going to watch this clip, but I'm going to tell you they're doing very simple movement. They're going double attitude, double attitude. That's a jump. They have two PK turns. They have two pinwheel turns, a PK arabesque like I told you, and then they run off run behind, and then come in with their double attitude jumps again across the back. It looks like there's millions of dancers, well not millions, but multitudes of dancers in this number because of the way the staging is. So let's take a look. Here you can clearly see the dancers going through the windows. 
Now the movement is really quite simple, like I said. If you watch it, it's two double attitude jumps, two PK turns, two pinwheel turns, and a PK arabesque. Then the dancers run off stage to that back wing, and they quickly get there so that they can come in in two lines. And as we know, lines easily make a circle, and a circle can easily make a clump. Here's an example of a clump becoming a circle. Well, two circles, really. You see the outside circle moving counterclockwise and the inside circle moving clockwise. At the same time, they have level changes going on with their high and low claps. And then you see that the circle easily becomes two lines, and whenever you have lines, you can make those tidy little rows. So now I've got them in these tidy little rows. Tidy little rows are always great because you can come out and in. So let's think of it like this. Here's row one, there's people in it. Here's aisle two. Here's row three, there's people in it. Here's aisle four, you see there's an aisle right there? And here is row five, there's people in it. And here is an aisle. We should have aisle zero too, there's an aisle over there. Okay, so now I've got them here. Whenever you have people in rows, you can do the right left thing and put them into their aisles. And it just makes the whole, it makes the whole stage be in rows, come apart, be in rows, come apart. And it, it looks cool. All I have them doing is a little shimmy step. They jump in the air. They either go this way or this way or this way and they fall into the aisles. You see? Then when they jump back in, they're all in their rows again. Now this is a very tidy little way that you can have dancers really, really grouped and then all of a sudden they disperse and go into the aisles and then all of a sudden they can jump and come back into their rows and it's neat. The next thing I have them do is this guy has to walk in place, this guy has to walk in place, and this guy has to walk in place. This guy has to take big steps. That guy's going there. That guy's going there. You see what I mean? That guy's going there and that guy's going there. What am I doing? I'm making a row of dancers across the back. So now I've got all my nine dancers in one line back here. And we have dancers all in a line. You can do neat things. What I did is they did a little, oh, what do you call it? I would be a cannon, but it's like, broom, 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 broom. They do the, the movement all the way down, one after the other. It turned out really cute. But that was the map for it. But now I'll show you the movement for it. Here's the movement that the dancers do. They're in their rows and they're going to go into the aisles. Here's how they get there. They jump on one, two, pull three, four, down five, six, seven, eight. Shimmy front, shimmy back, shimmy front, shimmy back. They're all in aisles. They're going to come back to rows. One, two, pull back to your rows. Five, six, seven, eight. Now, some go to the right and some go to the left. They kind of go into the aisles, shimmy to the side and come back, and shimmy to the side and come back. So you see them going like this, shimming to the side. From there they walk back. One, two, three, four. I'm doing the person who hardly moves at all. Seven, eight. They have their pose. They're, they're now in a straight line. They have their pose. One, two, any pose. All the way down and seven, eight. Then I guess this could be called like the domino effect. They just ripple into poses down the line. Five, six, seven, eight. So I won't dance that for you because it doesn't have the same effect with just one person doing it. But we'll look at a little clip of that in slow motion so you can see it a little bit better.
This next demo is really pretty. This is from a piece I did called the Hebrew Peace Prayer. And you'll see that the dancers have two kinds of props. They're using their dresses or their skirts as props, and they're, al they're also holding candles. Not real candles, but the kind you get from the craft store that are with batteries and have a little light on the top. So in this Hebrew Peace Prayer, I wanted to do some staging that Oh, could really show the beauty of the dresses. I have them attached at the wrist. And so I wanted to use a lot of different formations. The section I'm going to show you, I have the dancers bure into a straight line like this. They just bure across the stage until they're in a straight line. Here's our downstage. Once they're in a straight line, there were eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, good guess. Okay, there was eight of them. These two take one step out. These two are going to take two steps out. These two are also going to take two steps out, just they get a little bit farther. These two take smaller steps out, and these two hardly any. So what happens is, I open up this diagonal and it makes sort of a circle. Then I pull it all back in. So they just do some movement and then they do the movement into the reverse so they're all back in their line. Now once they're back in their line, I have them moving up sort of like a procession. And then this dancer goes this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These two go, the next eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here we are in our cannon. They all do that, they all go eight counts later. These dancers go in this direction. They go to the corner, they go to the back, and again, this one does the same thing. Goes to the corner, goes to the back, they all do this, I'm just drawing the little map. Then, I have them start across this way, and they meet in the middle here. These two dancers are meeting in the middle. They keep going and they exit. So you'll see this in canon, it's really beautiful. So let's just review, here's their path. We'll just take the one dancer. She goes to the downstage corner, all the way upstage, crosses right here in the middle, meets her partner, and then exits into these wings. You'll see with the dresses, this looks very full and the dresses create a lot of depth and beauty. In watching this dance, you'll really see how the flow of the fabric adds depth to the staging. Here's where the dancers turn out of their line and make that little circle pattern. And now they're just going to reverse their movement and come back into the line. As I said, there's sort of a procession coming forward as the dancers peel off, go down the sides where the wings are, and they end up upstage in the corners. Then their combination moves across the stage. You can see I have a waltz right there where they meet. And each dancer does that combination right off the stage. We're going to talk about a little bit more complicated staging. Now, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in my little dance world, I have to make up the pattern, then I make up the choreography to follow that little pattern. So I map out my pattern first, then I make up the choreography. So we're going to talk, we're going to make a little pattern. I'll show you how I do it. Let's say this is the stage. This is the upstage and the downstage. In other words, let's say, Here's the audience. Here's everybody just sitting in the audience, okay? And we have wings over here. Here's our wings. And we have wings over here. And we're going to make up our patterns. In this particular pattern, I'm going to have two dancers enter from the corners. So here's my two dancers. They're ready to come in. What they're going to do is this. Let's say this is the middle of the stage, right there. My dancers are going to come in and I'm going to have them go in this pattern. They're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're almost to the middle. In the middle, they're there on count number one, and they keep going. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now they're at the complete other diagonal of the stage. From there, I'm going to have them loop around and go backwards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
From there, I'm going to have them come across the back of the stage, the very back, like this is the cyclorama, right? There, so they've got to hug it close. They're coming in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I've got my two people right here. Then I'm going to have them come forward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This guy too. And then I'm going to have them dance right here. Now to further complicate things, I have two dancers over here that are going to do the exact same thing except on the other foot. So let's say these guys start on their left foot and these guys start on their right foot. So these guys come across. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now you can see they're going to meet right here on the second eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They loop around and go back. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, turn the corner, seven, eight. They come across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got one right here and one right here by then, right? And then they come forward one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now these guys are here and look, I've got a whole row, oh, this one should be right with the others. I've got a whole row of dancers right here in a line ready to dance in front of the audience. Now to even further complicate things, we don't do it with just one, two, three, four dancers, but eight counts after. Now this would be a cannon, sometimes called a round, you know, like three blind mice or row, row, row your boat. Every eight counts, more dancers do it. So, for instance, these guys start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Next dancer's in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Next dancer's in. One, two, three, four. You get the idea. Now, the little trick is, by the time they're coming down here, everybody's got to be out of the way. You know, the people coming. So these guys are coming in on the fourth count of eight. You with me? The first people, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Second people, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Third people, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fourth people. By the time the fourth people come on, these guys have got to be out of the way. So when I was making this up, I thought, you know, it's going to be awfully crowded here for at least four counts of eight. So it has to take four counts of eight for these guys to get down here or else I'm going to have a crash. So let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Loop around three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They just barely get out of the way on time. So now that I've got my pattern made up, by the time I have four groups of dancers do this, I'm going to have four rows of four people to dance in rows. And then in rows you can do lots of different staging. But before we talk about the rows, let me show you the choreography that's this pattern, the one that crosses the stage. Here is some choreography to exemplify how you fill in that little map that I drew with choreography. Now, because I did this on a stage, a proscenium of 40 feet, I'm going to have to take baby steps right now to show this to you because you've got to really move your dancers. So this is the baby step version, but you'll get it. Let's say I'm at the very edge of, this, of the upstage and that the middle of my stage is right over there someplace. So I'll tell you what has to happen in the middle. So here I come, I just come bounding out of the back wings. I have four, three walks and a kick. I come out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because you know, here come some more dancers and this is kind of like, oh, hello, here you come, you know, greeting them. So again, that choreography is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. From there, I want to get to my X, the middle of my stage. So it's here on eight. One, two, three, four. I'm getting right to my X. Three, four. I come across five, six, seven, eight. So it's taken me two counts of eight to cross the entire length of the stage. Let's look at it again. And you know that little jump, that saute jump? I wanted the dancers to saute right through the center of the stage at the same time. I made that up ahead of time. It, so you got to kind of think of these things, what you want to happen right in the center of your stage. All right, here we go again. We have one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, center stage, five, six, seven, eight. From here, I've got to make my loop around. One, two, three, four. I come to the very, very edge of my proscenium as far forward as I can go and pivot five, six, seven, eight. Now I've got the kids as close to the wings as they can go because we want to be out of everybody else's way. Remember when we're going backwards, those two counts of eight. So let's do it one more time and then I'll keep on going backwards. Walking with a kick, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, to the edge of the stage, one, two, three, four, five, six, walk, seven, eight, one, two, walk, three, four, chasse, five, six, walk, seven, walk, eight. Now I did that chasse and the two walks so I could turn the corner because I just came down the wings. So I did my chasse on five and six, five and six, turn the corner, seven, eight. The group that I'm demonstrating is now going to turn on their left foot. Remember, they're going in towards each other. One, two, three, four, walk, five, six, seven, kick, eight. Now I've got those four dancers in the back, all kicking on count number eight. These dancers over here started on their left foot. Now they're over there. So I've got to be a little tricky when I get over there and make them start on their other foot. How I do it is the dancer on this side, you saw me go turn, turn, walk, walk, and kick. The dancers over on this side are turn, turn, chasse. Let me do that one more time so I can make it a little bit more clear. Now what I'm trying to do is get everybody to kick their right leg on count number eight. So this group coming down, they're turning on their right foot. One, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight. So they have to do the little chasse so they can cheat to their right foot. So now I've got all four dancers in the back and they've all kicked on count number eight and I want to move them forward. So from here I had five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, and four. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. Down to the ground because now I have dancers coming in from the back and I want them to be seen. Five, six, seven, eight. These dancers on the floor are the only ones that really do this because nobody else has the time. The, the second row gets to go down, but only the first and second row gets to go down. From there, the first row, they get up and they're ready for the combination of the four lines by the time they get up. So just to make that all a little bit more clear, I'm going to bring on my demonstrators, Candace and Amanda, and they're going to dance that for you. But I must warn you, we're taking baby steps. We're just taking tiny steps so that you can see them. When you do this on stage, you want to really eat up all the space and start from your corners far away. Let's watch this demo. Let's do another chart formation. This one's a little bit complicated and you know, I'm showing you these maps, not so much that you do them exactly like I do, just to show you how you can draw out a map and then fill in the movement. So let's look at this next example. In this combination, I again, there's upstage, there's downstage stage. I again have dancers entering on the diagonal from here. They enter at the same time and just like before we're going to decide who goes in front of who. So let's have this guy go a little bit in front of this guy. So they're coming in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and they meet in the middle middle. This is the middle middle of the stage. 
They keep going. Eight counts. Then they come back in and meet in the downstage middle of the stage. So now they're closer to the audience. So now they're going to meet again. So they've had two meeting places now. The dancers are going to meet here, come over here, and back to the middle. So if we're counting it out, they come in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Come back two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and meet again in the middle. Now this movement here has to be lower a lower level than this movement here, right? Because otherwise you won't see these guys. I have dancers coming in, of course, every eight counts. <clears throat> so we want to make sure what happens here is a little bit lower, I have them doing a bow, than the movement right here. So after they cross each other in this little bow thing, I have these dancers start to move to the back like this. When they're moving to the back, it gets a little bit complicated. You have to have all of your windows figured out, like they're going to sit one, two, three, four, and move here five, six, seven, eight, so they don't bump into the people on this path. So usually what I do is, with just with some cheap masking tape or something, I'll tape out the path that I want them to do, and then I take little dots, you know, little red dots or green dots, you get them as stickers to close uh, letters or envelopes, just those little stickers, and then I put them like this is have to, you have to be here on count number four, you have to be here on count number eight because somebody's going to be jumping through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, they've got to be not here, these guys, on one, two, three, four. So it takes a little figuring out, it gets a little complex, and you just kind of have to look at your floor in your studio and figure it out and put the dots and put the counts on the dots that you want them on that dot. That's how I did it. And you'll see it's pretty complex. These dancers not only go to the back, they roll to the back, and then they stand in the back. But because there's so much going on here, I kind of can fudge these guys in the back. And after I have eight people doing this, when they go to the back, I ended up with four in this line and four in this line. So after they went to the back, I got them into two rows. And then when they're in two rows, it's kind of like starting from a clean slate. There's lots you can do in rows. But I wanted them in some tidy little rows back there after all that chaos of coming through with all this staging. So let's take a look and I think I can make it a little bit more clear. Here's the movement for that map. Let's watch the first dancers when they come on. They're going to come on turning on one, two, three, four. Sauté five, six, hitch in the center, seven, eight. They run one, two, leap three, four, and passe over five, six, seven, eight. Turning in on one, two, arabesque on three, four, and here they get to the center, and they do that low bow, five, six, seven, eight. Now you see them moving toward the upstage. They're going to go down with a roll, and you'll see them stand back up, and start to make their way into the decided places we've already assigned for them. All the other dancers are performing this combo in canon and the stage is filled with interesting shapes and levels. Of course, everyone is going to go back like they did, those first two dancers, and end up standing in the back upstage. But as I said, we really had to tape the floor and put our little dots everywhere so everyone knew where to go. So everyone ends up going upstage, and then I do one of my favorites. I get them upstage and I put them in two lines because you can do so much with two lines. This Santa kick line from my Nutcracker All Jazzed Up was a real crowd pleaser. Let's face it, audiences always go nuts for a kick line and they're really fun to stage. So you saw the two lines, they easily became one and then they did that little pass around thing and then they became two lines again, which easily becomes a circle. During the circle, I gave the audience even more to cheer about by having kick lines cross the stage from right to left. This was really cute. This finale number also used a kick line where the front line crosses through the windows of the back line. Right here. Again, these two lines are easily going to become one line again. This took a little practice, but the effect is really nice. 
Here's one of my most very favorite um, staging tricks. I use this one a lot. And uh, the pattern, the dancers and I call it hot lunch because the first time I did it, I did it in a dance called hot lunch and it was very sensational. Everybody went, ooh. So, you know, you just change it a little bit, different music, different costume, a little bit different movement, but pretty much the same map. So here's how hot lunch works. Hot lunch always starts with dancers back here in lines. So let's say I have dancers back here in lines. And we always know, let's just say I have four, even though there's always more than that. We always know that this is the row and in here is the window or the aisle. So I'm going to have some other dancers coming in behind them. I always have to start with the two rows for hot lunch. And so these dancers here in the front are going to establish what is the row. These dancers have to just oblige them and go, well, since she's standing here, I guess my window will be right there, you know, since these guys are here. Because they can't see this guy, right? They're in front. So these dancers back here have to go into the windows. All right, here's how hot lunch works. Usually in hot lunch, I'll first have the rows go to the right and the left. So they do the right-left thing like this, and they're in canon. Don't have to, but it looks neat. Then these dancers come forward. Now your first dancers are the most important dancers coming forward. And I always have them coming forward in some big sens sensational way like chasse, step, leap. You know they're going to do some big thing or kick or they do something big as they're coming forward. These guys are going to come through eight counts later. But what am I going to do with these guys? I've got to get them out of the way. So what I, you can do it two ways. You can say, look, you danced here, so you go into the aisle. Then these guys kind of have to shift over to be in the row. So that's kind of hard. The easier thing to do is to make the first dancers who have established the row stay in the row. It's a little bit tricky for them, but they can do it. So they come down. They stay here, and then they start their path going back. One way you can do it. That's how it's going to be in the second example I show you. But in the first example I show you, it was like this. They come down, they move over, and they start on their way back. Now you see they're starting on their way back. So these guys coming down, look, they're going to bump into them. So these guys, they have to kind of move over a little bit to come through, which is a little bit tricky. So it's easier if you have these guys come there and then go right back into their row. Just go right back up. Then everybody else can come down and join them. Sounds so complicated, and you know what it is. But let's look at some slow motion clips, and you'll see how hot lunch works. Before we look at the clip of the dance, let me just show you the choreography. It's really very simple, but if you know what the choreography is, it's kind of a little bit easier to recognize what's going on. So remember I said I'll have them move to the right or left first. So here's my right and left. One, two, three, four, five, six, walk, seven, eight. Now the first line has already gone, but that's what the second line does to wait while everybody has taken off and established the rows going forward. Then the choreography goes forward. One, two, jump, three, and four. Turn five, six, to the front, into the splits, seven, eight. I'm in a row. I just came up. Here come some more dancers. I'd better get out of the way. I get out of the way just barely. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I'm in the aisle. I've got to move back because dancers are coming forward. They need the place to go. So in this example, I move back until I'm in place. Then you see dancers on the floor here waiting while all those other dancers are doing hot lunch forward. They're all just jumping away to the front of the stage. We're waiting and when everybody gets in place, I have some kind of unison movement for them all so that they can all come back and resolve into unison. So now that you know the choreography, I think it'll be a little bit more clear to watch the clip. Let's watch it. Okay, let's watch this staging since you already know the choreography. As I said, the first group of girls aren't going to do the turn. They come forward on the one, 
two, three, and four. But the back lines, as they enter, do the turns. So they have something to do while the other lines are coming front. Now, did you see how the lines had to sort of shift over so they could make it into the row? Watch the middle of the screen. This girl barely gets out of the way on time before the split starts. So you really have to practice knowing which are your aisles and which are your rows. Now, as we know, I always like to resolve a, a chaotic picture like that with some unison. And here, I just had everyone in such tidy little rows. Let's look at that whole combination again, but up to speed. And I think you'll get an idea of how complicated the staging looks, but how really simple the movement is. So now we had to establish where are our rows and where are our aisles. Here's another version of what I call my hot lunch staging. You can see I have my little formula going on where the groups go from right to left first. Then a group comes through and they establish what will be the aisle and what will be the rows. So the second girls through, they have it kind of easy. They just have to know who to follow. Let's look at some ways to end your dances. The famous dance pioneer Doris Humphrey said that your ending of your choreography constitutes 40% of the impact of your dance. Well, she also says that symmetry is lifeless and all dances are too long. So that's all food for thought, but let's just look at some dance endings. I'm coming to the end of my dance here, and you'll see that the dancers are all going in and out of their tidy little rows. They dance in rows and then go into their aisles with right-left choreography and then back to their rows. To exit, that middle row is going to face back and pas de beret off while the other rows keep dancing. Here we have the next two rows facing back and pas de beret off. These last rows could do that if you liked, but I had them all just end in a pose. This is an example of creating an ending picture and then doing a bump to black blackout. Here I also create an ending picture, but the picture is going to fade out slowly as the dancers wave bye bye. In this variation, the stage starts to darken very slowly and then the curtain falls as the dancers are still dancing. This is kind of different. In this huge finale number, I ended the dance by choreographing the bows at the end of the dance as part of the dance. It was just a little something for a change, and it allowed the dancers to each have a moment of acknowledgement as the dance came to an end. And actually, the audience seemed to really like it. They were cheering by the end. <laughs>